Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. We're going to do something a little different this week. There's a lot of news happening in the industry, and we kind of want to get right to it and talk about it. So today we're going to do a little shorter podcast where we bring you the hottest news of the past week that we want to talk about. With me today on the podcast is writer Chris Smith. How you doing, Chris? Doing really good, John. Joining us is fellow writer Christopher Bruce. How you doing? Doing great. All right, so we're going to start off this week um, with an article about the GT500, and I want to throw that over to you, Smith, uh, because you've been writing about the GT500 a lot for us. So what's the news? It all boils down to something that originated really way back in 2003, 2004 with the SVT Cobra. It's comparisons with the GT500 against cars that you wouldn't normally expect. And um, there was Jason Camisa that did uh, a really outstanding video where he drove the GT500 against uh, the Hellcat, which, okay, that's that's a pretty apples to apples comparison. But then they took it on to a track with the Ferrari 812 Superfast. And, and this one, this is the one that got me the most, the Porsche 911 GT3 RS. Um, and, and to give a little background, uh, Jason Camisa is a friend of the site. He's written for us yes. before. He's a, he's a veteran. Uh, and he makes great video. This is an amazing video, just the production quality, as well as the fact he got these this trio of really supercars to bring together to go against the GT500. So tell us tell us how it did against each one. Absolutely. And yeah, if you haven't seen the video, uh, we've got the, the article up at Motor One with a link to his video. Um, I mean, in short, the GT500 is punching way above its weight class. Um, way above. Way, way above. It, it, well, we we should uh, we should clarify that way above in terms of handling because the GT500 never had a problem going fast in a straight line, um, and for this comparison, it beats the Hellcat. Okay, which, and it it handily beat the Hellcat like by it, car it, lengths. It it handily beat the Hellcat. Well, and and Jason points out in the video, you know, when you're not at a prepped drag strip surface, which really the Hellcat and especially the Demon, those cars are designed to launch hard from a prepped drag strip surface. In the real world, it's a little different, and that video really kind of showcases that. And they they did it in the video on an airstrip, so it wasn't a prep yes. drag surface. Right. I, I think I think the demon on a prep drag drag surface would win. Yes, I, I oh yeah, I, I still think it would win uh, pretty easily. Just the way that car launches, I mean, it's it's set up to launch out of the hole. Um, just having the horsepower is neat, but that car is really set up to launch. The GT five hundred though is set up to accelerate pretty hard and handle. And with that carbon fiber track package, that makes all the difference in the world. Um, I kind of glossed over the Ferrari. They did line up the GT500 with the 812 Superfast. Doesn't quite hang with f- the Ferrari. The Ferrari was, was just able to launch a little bit better and the Ferrari held the lead over the GT500. But the Porsche, Folks, we're talking about a 911 GT3 RS on a track driven by a professional racing driver. The times were, I think, less than two tenths of a second apart. That's a GT500 versus one of the best handling production cars in the world right now. It was it was a virtual tie. I mean, I mean, it really was. They, they, if they had done two more laps, then I'm, I'm sure that they could have eked out a scenario where the GT500 would have been ahead. Now, does that mean the GT500 is just absolutely carving the heck out of corners? It's, I mean, it's doing pretty well, but I mean, let's be honest, the GT500 has a tremendous horsepower advantage over, over the Porsche, the GT3 RS. And what you're seeing is the GT500 really taking the Porsche in the straights, the Porsche coming back to get the GT500 in the corners, but the GT500 still has enough in the corners to balance it out over the whole track. And that's something that we've never seen from Mustang before. Yeah, it's crazy. But we also we also wrote about another head to head matchup between the GT500 and the Corvette. Tell us about that. And, and, you know, I remember this one and I even talk about it in the article a little bit back when the SVT Cobra came out in 03, 04, that's, that was kind of the first time where people said, wow, can this Mustang actually hang with a Corvette? Of course, back then Chevrolet had dropped the Camaro. There really wasn't anything else to match the Mustang up against. And back then it was SVT Cobra against Corvette Z06, apples to apples. That was the ultimate evolution of both models right there. This, um, 
this comparison, it's the new GT500 with the carbon fiber track package against the current C8 Corvette, which is, of course, we know the Stingray. It's the entry level Corvette. Yeah, so it's, it's, not, it's the base. It's model, not really yeah. apples. It's not really apples to apples. But according to Motor Trend, with that track pack, the Mustang, the GT500 quicker around the track they didn't say how much they didn't list any time so they we were, don't have anything to go on there but you know you're talking about a mid-engine supercar really now against uh a kind of an was, old school for an engine car yeah it was strange that they were so vague about the specifics and you know i definitely the the lap times of the gt500 versus the corvette but any other details they left out so i i don't know why they did that maybe they're saving that for a video or or one of their tv shows but and it isn't apples to apples you're right this is the fastest mustang versus the slowest corvette yeah so and, we're, and, gonna, and we're took, gonna be getting corvettes that that i'm sure will eclipse the gt500 at some point and i gotta say i mean i think everybody knows i'm kind of a mustang fan but i'm a performance fan too i i took a little exception to that it's like okay it's this isn't really an apples to apples comparison i want to see now what the Z06, the new Z06 will do against the GT500. That sure. I don't, th- I don't think that's going to be a comparison at all. That's, I mean, just listening to that thing with the, uh, you know, in the C8R, um, and, yeah. and seeing the C8R. Yeah, that's. Uh, I can't wait for that. Well, and then there, there, there's probably going to be a Corvette above the Z06 as yeah. well. Oh, Who knows what two. was it'll be named? <laughs> maybe two, probably some electrification involved. Um, so yeah, the Corvette. I mean, this is the slowest Corvette. Uh, still, you know, it may have gotten trounced by the GT500, but um, what you get for the money is still incredible. Oh, yeah. Um, and hey, you know, there's room for a GT500R. <laughs> KR. Oh, you heard it. You heard it here yeah, first. KR. Yeah, really. Um, all right. Well, speaking of the the Stingray, it had a pretty good week. Uh, I want to move on to our next story, uh, which is that the C8 uh, 2020 Corvette has won the North American Car of the Year Award, uh, which was announced this week. Um, normally, they're announced at the Detroit Auto Show, but since the organizers of that show have moved it from uh, the wintry uh, January of Detroit to a much more summery June, uh, they didn't have that showed as the backdrop of the uh, announcing the awards. Um, so they just kind of held a ceremony. Um, but the Corvette won for Car of the Year. The runner-ups were... Uh, the Toyota Supra and the Hyundai Sonata. Um, and I think this was a p- pretty obvious choice. Um, both, uh, well, the Supra made a pretty big splash when it debuted, but it debuted far earlier in the year. And I think kind of interest and uh, had waned in it. Uh, I think the Corvette kind of arrived just at the right time for the judges to still be um, sniffing their Corvette uh, fumes and, and riding that wave. <laughs> Only the jurors are able to drive the Corvette. It's not really available to the general public yet. Some people upset online that the Corvette won, not because it's not a good car, but simply because no one else can drive it. Did, do you have any opinion on that? They had to actually bend the rules to include the Corvette because of the strike that right. happened at GM a few months ago. It pushed back the project production of the Corvette to 2020. So basically, under normal rules, the Corvette would have become ineligible for this year's Car of the Year award, but they made an exception because they would have had to have waited a whole year. And look, I'm sure that exception was somewhat driven by the economics of giving out awards and how they earn their money and all of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I I think, quite frankly, that whether it was this year or next year, the Corvette probably would have won. The the biggest debut this year that I can think of would be the Bronco, but that's going to be in a different category for the car car of the year award. That's going to be probably in the SUV of the year award. So I still think the Stingray would have won regardless. Um, And I think a lot of people forget that, uh, I mean, the the car, it's it's a good car, but it also just kind of turned the world upside down with what you get for the price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've I've said it on this podcast a number of times. It was a a, a once in a generation debut uh, in terms of how significant it was, uh, how significant the changes to the car were. And the 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 new benchmark it sent set for uh, bang for the buck. So right. not not surprised at all. Um, in the other categories, in the SUV category, the Kia Telluride uh, beat out the Hyundai Palisade, its its sister car, and the Lincoln Aviator. Um, I really thought that could have gone to any of them, but the Tellur- Telluride has been picking up awards left and right. Mm-hmm. So. Um, it, I, it's a car and driver 10 best. It's a, uh, I think an automobile award, maybe, I don't know. It's got like four or five awards already. 
Uh, and it, it, we're a big fan of it at at the Motor One offices too. So um, we're glad to see that one win. And then in the final category, uh, the truck category, the truck of the year uh, was the Jeep Gladiator. Uh, and that beat out the Ram Heavy Duty and the Ford Ranger. Again, that doesn't surprise me too much. The Ford Ranger was on sale all year and I don't think it set the world uh, ablaze when it came out. It was nice to see it back, but they didn't. Well, I mean, it's it's back in the U.S., but that's really the same truck that's been in other markets for years. Yeah, so that's I true, mean, too. I mean, is it new? Yeah, it's new in the U.S., but it's not really a new truck. And I don't think they brought anything new to the segment. I just right. think they they just they they, you know, uh, uh, created a truck that they could slot in there. Nothing really exciting about it. Not innovative, but it gets them on the board. Uh, and the Ram heavy duty. I mean, if you've got I mean, look jeep gladiator versus the ram heavy duty in terms of giving an award obviously they're going to do the gladiator because we've been waiting for a jeep truck uh for so long so uh i'm not surprised by that Mm. i did mention the ford bronco so let's move on to um some big news we had on the ford bronco this week i mean we don't really know much new about it but this week we've got our first glimpse really of a production body up till now all the bronco prototypes we've seen it's they haven't really been prototypes they've been test mules meaning it's going to be bronco underpinnings with they've essentially kind been of rangers a, that have been sliced up. right yeah. yeah frankenstein rangers frankenstein rangers with with weird beds um this new batch of spy photos it shows what appears to be a production body. There's still a lot of camouflage on it. Uh, the roof is completely camouflaged. Of course, it's wearing a camouflage wrap. And and I'm looking at the photos now. I can see some false panels that are pretty obvious underneath uh, that obscure body lines. But it still comes back to it's it's a freaking Bronco, man. It's square. Well, and it's and it's and it looks ready to go after the uh, the Jeep Wrangler. It signals that they've moved on from testing these Franken mules uh, that are built on Rangers to actually testing prototypes. So even if we're looking at false panels, uh, the real body is underneath there right, somewhere. Right. And and from what we can see, it's a square body. Like it's definitely inspired by the the Broncos of yore, mm-hmm. uh, and is definitely a direct Jeep competitor. And uh, I mean, and we kind of knew it was coming this way. We got a preview of the Bronco R that Ford ran um, in Baja, and and that right. I mean, obviously that's a highly modified version. But I mean, we knew it was it was going to be like that. Um, I mean, looking at this now, I mean, this is with forty one comments. I mean, this article. Only went up uh, yesterday. So, I mean, obviously, it's a very hot topic. And I agree with what you said earlier, John, that this could well be the big debut of 2020 uh, when it comes out. And really, it's I'm surprised we haven't seen prototypes like this in Spy Photos sooner because Ford yeah. says they're debuting this in the spring. That's in only spring. a few months away. Right. You know? But Very I think soon. a major takeaway, though, is you look at this, you look at the Bronco R, you look at them side by side. This test mule looks a lot, a lot like the Bronco R. Oh, and yeah. it, kinda, it just reinforces that Ford is telling the truth when they say it's going to really evoke the original Bronco. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm actually more excited about all of the innovative features they're going to have because we have so much has been revealed from patents for weird things um about the bronco so the removable roof and doors and um i think uh, the a pillar like there's so many patent stories that we've done on uh, just just weird little features that ford has been working on so i'm expecting to see a lot of cool little stuff in the bronco which i think will be exciting and i just um, want to applaud the motor one staff for really avoiding the inevitable oj jokes <laughs> that, uh, that are going to be coming you out soon. What? Now, now that we have the real the, what looks like the real bronco body man it, it's going to be hard to avoid those juices loose jokes i i think I, I i don't i don't know what age group it is but i think for for such a large group of people when they hear bronco they think of that vehicle but and, and that has kind of relegated the original bronco to mm-hmm. being forgotten and i i think that this new production Bronco is really going to wipe the OJ Bronco from people's collective memories and remind everybody that this was a very popular, very significant vehicle far before it was this F-150 based uh, yep. monstrosity that that uh, OJ was carted around in. It so started out as something very, very different. You're oh, very right different. about that. And and much more Jeep like and oh, yeah. sounds like what we're going to get back to. Uh, All right. uh, We're going to take a break in a second. But before we do, I just want to remind everyone that you can get our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. So please hit the subscribe button now so you never miss a show. 
All right, welcome back. Uh, I want to hop right back into the news. And next we're going to talk about a tiny little economy car that had uh, some really exciting news this week. Uh, the Yaris GR uh, from Toyota. Uh, Bruce, why don't you take us through that one? Sure thing. This is at least it looks that way, going to be forbidden fruit forever for us in the United States. And that's really unfortunate because this thing just looks like a ton of fun. Um, So this is, in essence, the road going version of Toyota's Yaris rally car, or at least as close as you can get to it. Um, and like a legitimate road, go- like not just like inspired by. Oh, or, no, 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 no. Yeah. When know. we get to the, it's got a 1.6 liter turbocharged three cylinder. That's right. Three cylinders. Oh, but that's great. Uh, in it is making 257 horsepower. And that is in Europe. And interestingly, the version that's in Japan is a tad bit more powerful at 268 horsepower. So got to save the best for your homeboys. Yeah, I guess oh, so. Yeah. But six-speed manual, all-wheel drive, a really trick all-wheel drive system at that. It's got Torsen limited slip differentials at both ends. Just looks like a this ton is inc- of fun. Incred- incredible hardware for what is, I mean, it's below an economy car. I mean, the Yaris is like a city, city compact. Right. And all-wheel drive, massive power, six-speed manual. I mean, this is... This is the cars that that get on posters in bedrooms. And uh, Toyota and is they cut the weight. They're using uh, carbon fiber reinforced polymer and aluminum. It only weighs two thousand eight hundred twenty two pounds, twelve hundred eighty kilograms. <laughs> that, I mean, that's epic for me right there. You can talk about the the power and the all wheel drive, but when you have that little weight, I mean. There's no conceivable way this thing wouldn't be an absolute riot all the time. I want to I want to like take this on a forest rally stage or go ice racing on a lake. Uh, This thing is amazing. But let's for contrast sake, let's talk about the Yaris that is sold in the U.S. Tell us about that car. So unfortunately, the Yaris in the United States is a slightly modified Mazda 2. Toyota, they massage this exterior styling a little bit. And the reason I said at the beginning that this is going to be re- remain forbidden fruit is that Toyota has no reason to bring a model that's exclusive to the rest of the world to the United States for a single, albeit very exciting variant. Yeah, sad trombone. We are stuck with the Mazda 2 based Yaris while the rest of the world gets this incredibly cool version of the Yaris completely mechanically different from the one we get in the US that is the basis for this awesome rally car and now gets this Yaris GR Ugh, man and one uh, last thing so we do know prices for the Japanese market and as always you can't quite translate prices exactly from one region to another but just to kind of twist the knife a little bit more base price in Japan is the equivalent of $36,100. So that's not even like this thing is, you know, going to break the bank. It's borderline. No, it's definitely, it's definitely expensive, but it would go up against, uh, I think like hot hatches that are in the mid or low $30,000 range. So I think, you know, and we'd probably have the same complaints about it that we do those cars, which is, oh, it's you get tons of power for the money, but it's cheap plastic inside, you know, which we're used to in this kind of car. Man, <laughs> what a what a disappointment. Totally forbidden fruit. Uh, hopefully we'll get to drive it anyway at some point and at least can can tell everyone what it's like. Or at least some of our European colleagues and we can help them with questions. For sure. Yeah, we've got motor ones around the world in Europe and they should be able to, to drive this for us. Uh, but still, I'd rather one of us drive it. Yeah. But, all right. Speaking of cars that are debuting, we had a couple more that I want to talk about. And one was a long awaited debut from Genesis. Why don't you tell us about that, Smith? Long awaited. The uh, GV80 is here. I think we first saw the concept way back in January of 2017. And, you know, I mentioned it in the uh, in the debut post. While the world has just been going SUV crazy, here's this still very young luxury company, Genesis getting by with just three sedans. It always struck me as odd that they launched this brand and they brought out three sedans before they brought out an SUV. Right. I never got why they why they did that and they did they had to they probably had they had to start with a sedan because they had the previous Hyundai Genesis that they you know they're just going to port right. over and make the first Genesis. But then they turned the Equus into the G90 
And then they do, what is it, the G70, G60? The G70, I think, was next. Mm -hmm. G70, so, so, I mean, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you have, you have the, what, the, the G90, the G70, the G80, and now you have the GV80. F from a, a standpoint of Genesis executives, I have to think that this was a very long time coming. But it's here, sort of. It debuted in, uh, in South Korea last night, American time, in the morning for South Korea. And um, it's actually going to go on sale there later this month. So, I mean, we've gotten so used to seeing new vehicle debuts and then, you know, maybe six, eight, ten months a year down the road, you can buy it. It's going to go on sale right away in South Korea. Now, it will be available in the rest of the world. There's, a, from what I gather, there's going to be a separate launch for that vehicle because the South Korean market uh, GV80 is a little bit different. Um, it's, it's offered with a diesel engine there. Um, the rest of the world... Genesis has been a little cagey on the details for engines, uh, but well, we're, we're going to expecting... find out. We're going to find out pretty soon because they're going to have a U.S. debut at the end of this month in Miami, home city of our headquarters. So we're going to be in attendance. And right. I think we'll find out more U.S. specs then. Right. I mean, we're expecting a 2.5 liter turbo four cylinder. I think a V6, uh, and I think the the high end is supposed to be around 380 horsepower. That's what's coming. What really impressed last night, though. Um, I mean, they were talking about some of the technology that's going into the GV80. And um, I mean, aside from just all the current suite of apps and driver safety systems and, and things of that nature, uh, Genesis is advertising basically a new noise canceling system that monitors real time road noise and then will emit basically a counter wave that counters that noise, supposedly to give you this extraordinarily quiet ride that's that's almost devoid of road noise i'm it's it's supposed to be the first of its kind in a vehicle i'm very curious to see how that sounds there are other noise canceling systems inside cars that i thought did the same thing but it sounds like maybe genesis has a new wrinkle to it yeah it it, it sounds like there's something a little bit different about this one they also have an automatic air filtration purification system that detects if uh, you know if there's anything bad in the air it'll automatically kick on so i mean genesis they are really trying to step into the luxury suv realm with a big emphasis on luxury it has the power seats i think it's power ventilated second row seats and, and to be uh, clear, this is this is going to be a two row SUV. Yes, so this is not yes. have a three, third row. Yes, this and is I, a two I, row. It's a, it's slotting against the uh, like the BMW X5, right? Um, Audi Q7. So it's uh, we, I, of course we don't have pricing yet for the United States. That should come later on. But it's since, definitely been a long time coming. Yeah, since there's a G90 and a G60, I would imagine there will be a GV90 and a GV60 as well. So I imagine they'll eventually get a larger three row SUV and a smaller compact SUV to go in their lineup. At least that's what their naming convention suggests. The large grill, I mean, the Genesis grills have gotten comically large, but it actually looks a little more at home it on, looks fine on here. the SUV. Yeah, it, yeah it, it looks it looks a little more comfortable. I think on this, <laughs> it, it, it looks a little more comfortable at, uh, you know, on the on the sedans. Yeah. Uh, oh. You know, it, it looks like maybe it doesn't want to be there. But, you know, honestly, the, G, the GV80, I, I think it's a it's a handsome first step into the realm. And, you know, we'll see where couldn't, it goes from couldn't here. Come, couldn't come soon enough for them. Speaking yeah. of oversized, comically large grills, <laughs> the GMC Yukon debuted as well. Sister SUV to the Chevy Tahoe and the Chevy Suburban. Uh, which have already debuted their completely new designs and new um, packages and platforms. Bruce, tell us a little bit about this because you wrote about it. Credit where credit's due. Jeff actually wrote this story, but um, ah, Jeff Perez. I, I I am knowledgeable at the, the Yukon. Like you said, it's the sister vehicle to the Tahoe and the Suburban. Um, and if you look past the grill, you'll see that immediately. The front end is completely different here, but the rest of it really shows that Tahoe Suburban look. Um, in terms of what's new, uh, we're getting an AT4 trim, which is kind of the rugged, you know, off-road E type of trim, and it looks really good. Um, there also, there's a lot more differentiation now between the standard Yukon models and the Denali. Um, the Denali has a lot more 
chrome on the outside, whether that's your style or not. It also gets a different look on the inside. There's a slightly different um, center stack configuration that puts the HVAC vents on top, whereas the other trims have it um, below, lower on the center stack. If you want a more luxurious alternative to the Suburban and Tahoe, here's your answer. Before we get to it, in terms of power, you've got 6.2 liter V8, 5.3 5.3 liter V8, and then kind of the surprise of the bunch, three liter diesel in line six. One thing GMC has always done well is sell Denali's. They oh, yeah. have created they have created this trim level and convinced people that it is kind of like a luxury trim. And really, in my opinion, it's not. If you get in it, uh, it's certainly priced like a luxury trim, but if you get in it and compare it to actual luxury cars from like BMW, Mercedes that are similarly priced, you'll you'll I think you'll come away thinking like mm, this is just a higher price trim that I got uh, suckered into uh, but they've done a great job selling it um, <laughs> yeah. so kudos kudos to them the AT4 is what I'm more interested in because they're kind of trying to make AT4 like the Denali for being rugged and off-road and I think it's the same way it's not like the AT4 models are are going to follow Jeeps and Land Rovers no, down no, 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 a, no. basically a the big thing here path. is you're getting an air ride adaptive suspension two inches of ground clearance off-road mode hill descent mode kind of some doodads yeah, basically see? you're paying for a suspension Trim. Although, I mean, when you put that in four low, you can jack that that adaptive suspension up. Um, it can do a thirty two degree uh, approach angle off road, which I don't that's think is bad. Good. Oh yeah, that's for for, some, for something that size. Right. What GMC is better at than anything else is marketing. They can take they could take this off the shelf uh, GM parts, put it together in a Chrome package or in an off road package and sell a lifestyle. And, and they've done that really, really well. Yeah. And I don't mean to, to put down anyone who owns Denali's or AT fours because it's all about how they make you feel. And if they're selling the lifestyle and you're buying into it and it makes you happy, that's great. Don't go following Jeeps down any boulder strewn <laughs> roads. Cause and I do got to say, I, I mean, looking at the, the Denali interior, I, I, think it looks so much better than what you find on the other Yukons and That's the Suburban what we heard. And, and, and the yeah. Tahoe. It just has a cleaner look. Um, it, it has a more luxurious look. Of course, uh, you know, I'm just looking at a picture. I need to sit inside to see how it really feels. But, uh, you know, kudos to them for actually doing more than just a badge this time. Yeah, really. Jeff, per- Jeff Perez was at the debut for us. And like you said, he wrote the article. He also did a video walk around and, and said specifically that the interior feels um, remarkably nicer than the last generation. So mm. who knows? Maybe they have stepped up to luxury and I'll need to eat my words. And the we'll- elephant in the room here is that the Escalade is coming. The new Escalade comes it's still in to come. So right. Less so if you want real luxury. Now, the baller version's coming. Yeah. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. You can follow Chris Smith on Twitter at CH Writing. Follow Chris Bruce at Chris Bruce 1985. And you can follow me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, I want to thank you two for being here on this week's episode with me. Pleasure. Always fun. All right. And thank you all out there for listening. We'll see you next week. Yeah.